adjunct professor at PNCA, and I am executive director of Converge 45. And it's really my, and really excited actually to welcome you to this presentation from the performance and visual artist, Basira Khan. Uh, this is co-presented with Converge 45 and PNCA's Howley Ford School of Graduate Studies, MFA in Visual Studies. Um, I really want to begin tonight's talk by saying that our, our activities here in Portland, Oregon lay within the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Oregon City Tumpwata, Watwala, Clackamas Chinooks, and Tualatin Kaliapua people uh, who were forcibly relocated to the Grand Ronde Reservations in 1855. Today, these tribes are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. The Grand Ron people continue to maintain a connection to their ancestral homelands and maintain a traditional cultural practice. Um, today's conversation is Converged 45's third in our series of programs called Portland's Monuments and Memorials Projects. That's working to bring people together to consider the conditions and the impacts of public monuments in Portland, those that have come down and those that should be built. Uh, we're doing this by we're knitting together artistic activities with civic dialogue to examine history, public space, markers of our tragedies and successes. Uh, this project is being co-organized by myself and Jess Perlitz with consultations from Converge 45's Curatorial Committee and the Regional Art and Cultural Council's Public Art Committee and actually some uh, consultations from Sharita Town. Uh, this is this project is funded in part by, from a grant from the Ford Family Foundation and additional support coming from RAC. Uh, and I also wanna thank Omnivore for the design of um, this image you see behind us, this fantastic graphic that we have. Um, you know, part of the ways that we're really working on these engagements is conversations like this one uh, in our previous talks with Jess Perlitz and historian uh, Rachel Hillier and the artist Alan Sansar on her work at Lewis and Clark's campus. Um, uh, her sculpture, York Terra Incognita. Um, that was followed up by a conversation between Paul Farber, the director and founder of Monument Lab with the artist, Michelle Angela Ortiz, uh, an artist, muralist and community educator, both in Philadelphia. And that talk centered on a project around a removed memorial in that city. Um, that talk, as well as an earlier one with Liz Ogbu, which dug into the process and politics of spatial justice were co-presented with Portland Parks Foundation, RAC, Portland Art Museum, and Converge 45. And videos of those talks are available on our website. Uh, we're also collecting ideas uh, for what sort of monument or memorial we would want in our city, or you might want in your neighborhood through an open call process. Uh, these responses will be shared in online forums, in an exhibition we're organizing for the end of August, and finally in a publication to come out next year. And I'll add links to in the chat to some of these um, some of these opportunities. Uh, and tonight though, we have this amazing opportunity to hear from Basira Khan, uh, whose process has been described as a cultural autopsy as they examine the physical and psychic impacts of fallen empires and colonial powers, monumental detritus and trauma for sure. I'm really thil thrilled that this program is finally coming together. Uh, you know, I was only able to meet Basira recently in November of 2019, her solo exhibition Snakeskin at Simone Sabul Gallery. Um, but this wasn't the first time that I got uh, to experience Basira's work. Uh, that took place in 2017, a participant in an exhibition titled I Am Muslimia um, that included textiles, archives, family heirlooms, performances, sculpture. Um, this exhibition was really impactful uh, to me. It really stuck with me uh, my entire trip to New York. And I just kept thinking about it when I came back. Um, it had such a dynamic and cerebral use of materials and concepts. It was just so clear that this was an artist who uh, we should bring to Portland to share with our community and that should be exposed to the students at PNCA whose practices vary so much. Uh, but Sira's work uh, works directly to address the way Islam and Muslim femme identity have been portrayed and misrepresented for decades, really centuries. This is intentional, of course, this mis uh, misrepresentation. Uh, it's to create and further otherizing us from one another, a power ploy long used before Adam Smith in capitalism, uh, but that has been weaponized so well by the psychotic economic system. Uh, Basira's work poke and push using material language in the creation of palmatic theory objects. A recent work leaning on a 1960s civil rights slogan shifts it to, I am a body with the crescent moon present there. 
These words declare like they did in 1968 Memphis, a space and a place for bodies unlike mine and perhaps yours. And I'm really excited that we can have Basira here tonight and that we can all dig into this work and this practice. And I'm so looking forward to it. Basira, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, really thrilled. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored by the introduction. So thank you for all the care. Um, so I wanted to just set the menu by saying that this presentation is gonna take about an hour. I'm gonna do like a, well, actually this is a seminar based uh, situation. So people will be writing questions into the panel. Is that correct? Okay, so what I'm gonna do at first is just share kind of like a poem, like a, a kind of a statement of, of, of um, setting my positionality in the world. And I'm gonna share that with you and then I'll go into the presentation and share eventually my production and my material-based work. Okay. Can I have some elbow room in this cannon? The cannon is a cannon. A body. An armchair weapon. One that refuses my care. but insistently rules over my body. Applies mainstream principles and standards. Sex plus violence equals art history. In a field where I race from my race as the cannon sits far away. Axiomatic, universally binding with little to no experience to judge me or my kin. It's a damn shame. There is no legacy that I may follow and my pain is my intimacy. Intimacy is what defines my politics. So I make work on my own terms from what I see. 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 So this next section is a video I'd like to share with you all. It is an excerpt from a really bad TV show. And it is a, the title of the TV show is The Agency from season two, episode one, it's called French Kiss. Um, and we will watch this together. We're gonna go on this journey together. It's about three minutes. And please keep some questions in mind 
Um, one of the reasons I keep showing this, one more time about the race. One of the reasons I keep showing this particular clip is over time, it just keeps gaining more and more relevance. Um, and there is an in, in a completely um, there's a focus in my work about surveillance, but it isn't just surveillance. It's about materiality and how material itself creates otherness and how it creates economies and how economies and capitalism is actually, in my opinion, what is creating bifurcations and identity, uh, what, what rules identity. So here we go. We're gonna go on this journey together. Maybe one more time about the rates. The box is $9.95 a month, but if you sign up for six months and pay by credit card, it drops to seven fifty. Too much math for me. Right, well, Etsy said is a two forty five a month. What would you do? She likes him. We're not interested in her. He's quite the salesman. One of his many talents. Subject departure. Mm -hmm. We got it. Do I have to decide today? Well, of course not. Just uh, take the form and let us know. This form requires a lot of information. Who's building the portal? Excuse me. Uh, what's the box? 401. The key doesn't turn. 401. What's your name? Nelson. It was okay yesterday. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had to change the lock. It was broken. It was broken yesterday. And your card's out of date. There's no address. This is my address. That's why I rent the box. Well, we need to know where you work, then. Raheem! I thought that was you. Who the hell is that? He followed the subject in. Check face ID. It's been a long time. Don't you remember? We met at the conference at Suleiman's. Oh, yes. No match yet. Is that a gun? Uh, sure looks like it. Our visitor has a weapon. As soon as I'm done here with my business, I need to talk to you about something. If you are not too busy, would you like to get some coffee? You could go down the street. Uh, sir, we need an emergency contact, an employer, friend. Come on, Mr. Nelson, just give us a name. He's spooked. We all have some. I'll come back later. Thank you, Mike. Put your hand Put it down. I'm going. Police! Stop your work! Hold your fire! I'm a federal agent! Keep your hands waiting to see him. FBI! INS. Secret Service. Isn't one of those guys supposed to be a terrorist? So, um, I think around 2015 to 16, early 17, I was being asked to do a lot of work um, about the confusion of of Islamophobia, xenophobia, anti-blackness, and in, within museum spaces, I would do a lot of talking and um, proposing terms. Um, so this is a, an example of a term that uh, terms that I was asking museum spaces to to provide for artists in 2017. So it's available, I believe, still on the Whitney site. If any of you are interested in seeing that manifestation. Um, I was creating uh, workspaces, uh, spaces for people to start to understand the way that uh, policies are oftentimes manipulated for publics to not understand actually what the policies are demanding of people and how they're bifurcating people and taking rights away based on titles that seem more utopian than they seem dystopian. And so we would get together in groups um, within actual like uh, gallery spaces that weren't having exhibitions. And we would, you know, do group talks, we would talk things through, we were trying to understand the situation at hand, um, especially after the 45th president um, came into office. And this was all also work that I was doing before um, the participant ink show in 2017 that 
um, Mac was talking about earlier. Um, some of the work that I was doing before that initial exhibition, to be honest with you, kind of like it was my, um, uh, you know, kind of cotillion in a way. It was like the, the, the participant show was kind of like this first time that I had the guts to, to share my work. Um, so before that, I was kind of doing quiet work. I was trying to understand my positionality and I was doing this thing that I call cards. And cards is like arranging all of these personal effects and personal archives together to make meaning. Because I was trying to kind of find traces of where I come from, um, having been uh, dislocated and not understanding my heritage. So the circle that is around my uh, my father, and this is one of about thirty uh, natives um, that that created the first school, the native school in Bangalore, India. It was called Alamine College and it's now been absorbed into the Bangalore University. Um, so this is just me trying to make a sense of, of again, of, of like migration, of displacement, um, my father being Afghani and East African. And then all of that work, I wasn't necessarily thinking about this show I did with Participant Inc. in 2017, but I think a lot of that work was um, happening in the background that then led to the material-based work that I did for I'm Muslima. And so one of the things that I made that became the thesis essentially of my practice was, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, what I would wear at my opening and I started to design my own Nike shoe. And then the Nike shoe itself led to a massive lawsuit and um, boycotting of the Nike corporation based on the fact that they thought that writing Muslim or Islam on the embroidery parts of the shoe would incite violence and that the name Islam or Muslim inherently uh, associated itself with terrorism. So um, over time, uh, especially after all the travel bans and like the like, um, you know, what I like to call Trump was disassociating from his body and just kind of like pointing his finger at every single group in America, whether it's the black community, the Jewish community, the you know trans community, the Mexican community, so on and so forth. Like he was creating all of these moats around his, you know, whatever it is that he was. And um, at the same time, I think the Nike Corporation was thinking, how do we actually enhance our bottom line as a corporation in, um, because they lost so much money during the lawsuit. So they changed the design of the shoe. So now you can't put any names on the shoe. You can only put three letters on the back of the shoe. So I started to collect as many shoes as I needed to make the sentences and words. Uh, at the same time, they uh, had Colin Kaepernick be the face of their programming and also started to offer modest wear for, you know, beautiful, you know, women, specifically in these photographs, they focused on women of color where they would have a modest, modest wear, hijabi wicks. At the same time, there was also implementation of, um, you know, like censoring certain words and those words pointed to the well-beings of these marginalized groups. Um, for some of the words that they were, CDC was forbidden to use during the beginning, the first hundred days of 45 was uh, fetus, transgender and diversity, all pointing to um, manipulating policies. So the shoe itself, you know, started to have some buzz uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, there's there's a whole sneaker culture to unique, uh, specifically Air Force One shoes. There's, you know, people who are feeling nostalgia about the shoe, but then also there's this like very interesting uh, dynamic about how this is a capsule of a moment in time that Nike has done a great job scrubbing from the internet. So this, the St. John the Divine Church uh, was doing this uh, thematic exhibition um, called Sanctuary. And so they asked me to display the uh, reading room on purpose, which, which exists in these acrylic boxes with an ongoing bibliography with the, with the Nike shoe. So during the course of its exhibition, I was um, very nervous about showing the shoe. 
Um, and, you know, one of the reasons was I was afraid that they would get stolen. And indeed they did get stolen towards the very end of the exhibition. And this, what we're looking at here is legal papers uh, to criminalize the person uh, and charge them with grand larceny. So this person was going to go to prison for a long time based on this theft. So, um, you know, this is just me taking clips of the footage of this person putting the shoes in his bag and walking away. But um, this was a really interesting and pivotal moment for me in my practice where I started to have to make really hard decisions. Um, one of the things that I had uh, pl plotted out around this project was creating a contract um, that if the shoes were stolen through any kind of like sneaker geek, you know, situation, um, that they that the church would then insure the the shoes for hundred thousand dollars, and that that would help me absorb the cost of my student loans and help to put a down payment on a house. Well, we all know that that's a fabrication of the truth now because you can't even put twenty percent down on a home anymore um, due to the growing housing market crash, but. Um, all that to say, that was a sidebar, but all that to say is um, we we actually started talking to the insurance companies and at some point I was like really disturbed that somebody was going to get put in prison and I didn't want that kind of juju on my work. Um, and so we I shifted gears and started talking to the DA's office and I just wanted my shoes back. Um, and so actually we were able to do a plea bargain and have these shoes returned to us. And then in the process of that, I learned that St. John the Divine Church is the biggest Episcopalian church in the world. And it actually has one of the largest um, uh, fibers uh, conservation workshops in the world. And so I was able to, you know, make sure that this person didn't go get put away for this action, but then also it broadened my, my, um, my network of people and, and ways that I can produce work. So that being said, the reading room on purpose is a very important tool for me to um, share beautiful material based works, but then also share that kind of other side, the dark side of that moon, like the, the work that goes into thinking about materials and thinking about erratic spaces and thinking about, um, you know, making art in a in a world where you don't even have people who have homes over their head during a pandemic. So um, the bibliography is really important to me. And anytime we do the reading room on purpose, the bibliography grows with our collaborators. Um, this is an image of the first reading room. And it, this was at Participant Inc. in the Lower East Side in New York City. And this one is at uh, uh, Colorado Springs and a, an intersection of some of the books that you might find. And the books are annotated. You're able to pick them up, look at them and write your own uh, notes down. And that all to say is I'm currently working on an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of Art uh, that will open October 1st. Um, and so one of the things that we had tried to do at the participant show was create a book called Kordesh On that kind of also documented a lot of the um, thought process and logic that goes into my practice. Um, and so we're now able to do that work. We're going to have this book ready for, uh, for the public in October, and you can purchase that book in the bookshop at the Brooklyn Museum. So stay tuned. Okay, so right about this point in this slide presentation, I've now covered a lot of ground and we can actually just play and look at these material-based works. So the psychedelic prayer rugs, these are um, found objects essentially that I have designed and put my own patterns on. I usually use Illustrator and I create the illustrations and then I send PDFs of those works to um, my, my fabricators that our work and live in Kashmir. And they have iPhones and I have iPhone. So we are able to do qual quality control based on color through uh, matching the wool yarn on the actual screen of the, of the 
of the computer of the of the phone. So uh, what are these images based off of? So I was kind of looking at the found object of the prayer rug as it is, as, as we all know it to be. There's usually a place to put your feet and a place to, uh, and, a, and, a, and something that signifies where you place your temple. Because usually when you bend down, you prostrate, you want to place your temple on the top of the rug. So based on that, in, that, that, that uh, integrated design, I was then thinking about looking at protest posters because I thought it would be a beautiful idea to have this square of meditation also um, be augmented by these movements of sovereignty of one's body. So I was looking at Grand Fury um, and started to develop my own kind of uh, interiority, my own kind of um, meditation and uh, uh, lived experience. I think that's the word I'm looking for. So this is the first um, installation of the psychedelic prayer rugs at Participant Inc. And it definitely is a queer installation, uh, but really it's, it's also uh, very uh, strategized to point in the Northeast location. And it was really hard for us to find, find out where that was happening, but we did this and they usually like to live next to the reading room on purpose so that people can put their shoes in the clear boxes and lounge on the rugs. And some might question why something so sacred is kind of being absorbed and exploited in this way. And I have a lot to say about that if anybody wants to have that conversation later on. Uh, this is another set of rugs, um, still looking at uh, protest posters and issues of sovereignty. And this is a kind of a close, this is a close up of one of the rugs because I wanted you all to experience the, this very specific uh, craft work of embroidery that happens in Kashmir. Okay, so we have acoustic blankets, another um, textile work. And you know, it's funny that I never really considered myself to be someone who is that interested in textiling, but I've always been interested in the way people adorn themselves. So, and my mom was a was a fabrics person, like you would call her something like a fashion designer, but there was nothing like that back in the day. So, um, so in, indeed everything I know about fashion, I pretty much learned from my mother. Um, so anyway, the acoustic blankets is derived from a moment of rec records, whether they were record keeping of people who are passing away or moving on, um, which is something that you do sometimes in volatile um, economies and war zones because you can never really trust the government to um, actually uh, take appropriate and accurate information. And so my father would do that work for his community. And then I also like, would live through these records because I didn't really have any other way to live through um, those experiences of, of just like thinking of a time before all of this war or thinking through a time when purportedly something seemed more innocent. Um, so I, so um, the other thing that I, I wanted to share with you about Acoustic Blanket is that um, as I was you know, going through the traditions of art school, undergraduate school, residencies, and graduate school, I um, tore this page out of Art Forum and kept looking at it and kept looking at it. And then during my thesis, I started to make connections with minimalist art, the theological ideas in Islam, and, and sculpture. And so that's kind of what swung me into the space that I'm in now. And it turns out that like the Dia Foundation, the Dia Grounds, Dia Beacon, I think was actually a mosque before. And that like lots of central European music that I was getting into that did work that was more spiritual and sculptural would work with Sufi leaders to make their music. And so I started to understand that actually like just like a Rothko painting is spiritual and erratic and about Christian theology. Uh, indeed, there were these modes and codes of 
of Islamic theology in works that I had been looking at for so long as well. But I was kind of growing up in graduate school at a time when thinking about spirituality and theological ideas was really not um, appropriate uh, because I think that my professors thought it was too emotive and they were pressuring us to think about things that were more systemic. And so I did get a lot out of that operation, but then I didn't really let up. So I went down my path and then also took the path of understanding structure as well. I wanted to throw a couple of slides in just to show you details of notes in the way that I organize some of my thoughts and then how I like keep this very quiet practice of drawing um, that, that really brings me joy. I usually do these drawings in winter months because my body slows down and I kind of just want to incubate. So drawing is a very affordable and like uh, spontaneous practice. And it also helps me define all of these different uh, uh, vantage points and ideas that are coming together. So in the end, this is the object. These are suits that I perform inside of, that I hide inside of, that um, oftentimes when I'm in the public eye, I perform songs that I've created and I do comedy routines. And I ask people to come up to me that say are wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt. And if they feel comfortable, we, we engage and we have these conversations together. They can't see me and I can't see them. It's really just about the texture of our voice or if they let me to pinch their nose. So I would go around in the suit all over uh, causing havoc and, you know, creating some sense of resistance or disruption, I think is a better word. So uh, I also took the blankets out of the exhibitions and I'd bring them onto the street during demonstrations. And I would take selfies by extending my hand out and having people take photographs with whomever felt comfortable standing with me. This particular moment of photography was the um, 2017 Women's March. I like to just put random ass slides into my um, presentation. This is my mom. But I mainly wanted to just show this to you for scale because um, one of the other things I thought to do was because this blanket itself was based on kind of Islamic geometry and um, minimalism, I wanted to go to a place that I saw when I was growing up. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Denton area, and we didn't really have a whole lot of contemporary art at the time, but we did have a lot of Walter Gropius graduate students who, <laughs> who are really, really important architects who came and, and made all of these huge important buildings all through and through. And I saw some of those buildings built. And then I would see these big sculptures, art with a capital A get care flighted in. So this Richard Serra sculpture, and I, I, I proposed like doing this love hate kind of dance with the piece. I brought in singers and um, horn players. And then I also uh, stood at the corner of the sculpture and threw my shoes up until it would lock into the top of the, of the sculpture, which obviously was impossible because it is even taller than the tall building behind it. Um, while I was doing that work, a friend of mine pointed me in the direction of a David Hammond's work that happened in 1981. Uh, you know, obviously from a completely different uh, point of view, but it was too similar to not add the slide in to augment this conversation. Um, the piece on the right is uh, a Richard Serra sculpture from 1981 in Tribeca. And this slide is kind of just like, boop, you know, it's like all that to say and all that work, I could have just put a nail in the wall and put it in a gallery and it would have been just as great. But now I've, I've kind of like imbibed this sculpture with all this performativity and history. The other thing to say about this work is the uh, gold portal entry of this work serves as a transition transitional moment. And um, those patterns come from my mom's side of the family collecting tons and tons of patterns. And so we sat together at one point and started to make decisions on what these patterns would look like. So braid rage. 
Braid Rage is a pretty massive uh, installation that is a body endurance practice as well. So at the time when I was actively doing this project, I was doing a lot of training. It was getting a lot of oxygen to my mind and helping me deal with senses of trauma uh, by managing through exercise. Um, and so I, I, this is a very uh, word-based project. I'm very specific about anyone who shows the work has to use corners of my body. They can never really describe the work as parts of the body or curves, you know, cause I'm really kind of pushing against having uh, you know, a femme identifying body or body itself being referred to um, in other ways. I really wanted you to think through the corners of my body, like elbowing your way into a space. And so um, I would also add uh, parts into the resin molds uh, just to create a sense of DNA so that if these parts ever separated, they would be filled with the same materials which are hypothermia blankets, cha wearable chains, and hair. And I've been lucky enough to have performed this work several times uh, throughout several years. And the last time I performed this in 2019 before the lockdown, the University Art Museum at Albany, I was able to do like a pretty good um, documentation of it. So I was able to make a film. This is, in, this is there in Albany. So I was able to make a film that will then be screened at the Brooklyn Museum. And it was also previously screened at the New Orleans Museum of Art during 2020. Just details of what you would see if you were to look at the installation. And then I, uh, part, of the insta part of the performing night where I would climb myself, the corners of my body, I would adorn myself with this um, soot, this, um, these ash, the charcoal. And um, it's a cleansing tool. Um, and I would do, I would perform, would do, I'd perform this thing that Muslims all over the world do before they pray, before they meditate. And that enabled me to become a drawing instrument and then climb this system and then be able to make a trace of where I struggled to get to. And this is the initial installation at Participant Inc. And you know, the night of the opening, there's a lot of what you would call spectatorship, but actually it's not because it's in the culture of indoor rock climbing to, to crowd around and cheer the person on as they climb to the top. So it was really like a group effort. Just different locations of performing. This one was in Italy and it, it took a slightly different place because uh, we couldn't actually get the materials in. So what we actually did was worked with a group of students who uh, I taught them how to make molds out of pasta and we would do the corners of their body. And then we made an installation of their parts there. Sorry, I said parts. <laughs> um, we made an installation of the corners of their body and then they balleted me so that they could have a say in where I would make the drawing. And that's the end result. And a friend of mine encouraged me to create a record of the movement on paper. And so this comes from me experimenting with that. So there's a grouping of drawings that are just the remnants of the, of the endurance project. Okay, so seats. This is just my family wilding out in a really crazy house that I grew up in. Lots of seating and panel and ornamentation everywhere. This is an image of my mom just sitting down trying to take a rest at Urban Outfitters. But I, I threw this in here because it's a, a perfect example of these large corporations kind of co-opting and appropriating signs and symbols um, in, in such a very unique way. It almost looks like I staged my mom. 
But at the same time, I was looking at powerful figures, um, antiquities, and specifically uh, images of, of these spirits being seated. So I developed uh, my own set of seats and I called this set of seats Karaoke Spiritual Center of Love. Um, this was first installed at the Sculpture Center in, at the beginning of 2018. And the materials come from, uh, you know, all of these clothings that my mom would hoard for me, uh, prayer rugs and, and head coverings and um, traditional gar garments. Um, and so I wanted to transform them and I ended up using them as the upho upholstery for this project. Uh, inside these um, lit light seats was uh, speaker cabinet subwoofers. So when you actually ducked under and came into the space, you were able to sit down and listen to popular music and sing along with the TV monitors, but then your butt would be titillated as well. And you would just be very aware of your body with relation to the architecture. And I think you can play this just to get a feel for being in there. And let's see, how do I get out of it? Okay, so after that, you know, it was site specific. So after that, I started thinking about, okay, um, sculptures about objecthood, painting is about the gaze. And so I wanted to take the tops off of the sculptures and actually place them on the wall to move them from a three-dimensional philosophical conversation to a two-dimensional philosophical conversation. So I like the idea of denying you a seat, denying you comfort, but then kind of staring at it and waiting for something, like uh, waiting for some sort of um, comfortability that didn't ever come. But then, um, you know, this was also dragging me back into painting, something that I studied in school. And I, you know, kind of had a small career painting when I initially uh, entered into whatever we call this, the contemporary art world. Um, but I actually left art for a while because uh, I couldn't handle uh, the kind of um, disassociation of like knowing the market and knowing the consumption and then not being able to uh, reconcile with that. But after a while, the participant show was the first show that where I actually came in and felt like I was defining my own terms. And which is why I like to start my slideshow with the poem at the beginning. I was looking at also fast fashion. I was thinking about these powers, these symbolic powers or these um, you know, really important um, religious symbols such as the prayer rug. And I was thinking, well, you know, like these, these underwear, the vibe slave vibes I bought them from like H&M, you know, sometime long ago. I was thinking about how those underwear were manufactured in the same building as the rugs, as the fringe of this petticoat and none of those people had any agency because I remember reading about how those Bangladeshi people were um, crushed under a building. Um, there was also a, a news report about them identifying people getting crushed in, in Mexico. There was just a lot of conversations about these buildings crushing because there was no infrastructure and no one was getting paid. You know, these are very poor conditions of living. Um, and so I thought to myself, well, if that's how these symbols come about, then I need to disrupt this and call into question about what this is anyway, which is one of the reasons I liked making my own prayer rugs from my own hand and my own vision. So all that to say is, I say that a lot, all that to say is, um, I started to intentionally move the project forward and think about the seat for the wall. So all of the works before were kind of like in between the sculpture and the wall, but now I'm like, okay, I'm doing the show at Jenkins Johnson. I wanna make sculptures for the wall. 
So I started looking at like systems of anatomy where clothes hang on your body architecturally. Like, so for example, like clavicles and shoulder, shoulder blades and whatnot. I was also mining for uh, silhouettes of the chrome of one's head, the dome of one's head and the way that one adorns their heads with material or the way they rest their hair. So I was taking those silhouettes and then creating these seats from that. And later on, I also started to just think about seats itself and how seats and sitting um, and representation has a lot to do with the way that we have comfort and have safety living in this society. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this arrangement, I'm sure you do, but these are the house representatives in the way that they are seated. And so I started to develop, uh, you know, the seat section of the work called house. I know I have nested titles. It can be confusing and it's okay, but just know that this is the ideas that are going into me going from one step to the next to the next. It really doesn't matter what these things are called and when these things were made. I'm just trying to create a kind of logic behind how I go from one material to the next. And so I made these collages and you can see that I'm using the black and white is a family family photography and there's hole punching. I'm hole punching the seat, the house of representatives out with a leather hole punch. And then the color formation in the back is indeed the femme identifying um, uh, representatives that are there now seated. And I, I, I feel very uncomfortable with like bold, bold portraiture. So I'm oftentimes trying to obfuscate the face or like trying to give it some space to where you don't get all the information of the face. I don't know why I do that. I was doing that even with the blankets. Okay, so privacy control gets us back to the, the short video of the TV show that we're looking at. Senses of safety. Um, the two-way, and we're almost done here. So the two-way mirror um, is a material that came to me just kind of sitting and lounging in a mosque. This is a mosque that my family helped develop and build in Texas. And I kind of was just around these materials and this kind of architectural design. Um, and one day I was just kind of bored listening to the mom. He was just not saying anything too interesting. And then I started looking through the material. I looked at the material, like behind the material. All of a sudden I had like four different ways of seeing or something. And I started thinking about numbers. I was like, there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. There's 1.8 billion Catholics. There's like how many billion people? Like 6 billion people? Like I was like, wow, I'm this person this like feminine identifying person. And I'm looking at this material and I'm getting the sensation and the little hairs on the back of my neck were kind of like, bing. And I was like, I need to make an artwork about this material of this material, because there's like surveillance ideas in this work. There's like issues of the way, um, you know, you can even walk around New York city and there's like, you check yourself out in that material or, you know, you're using this material to obfuscate. Um, I just needed to make something. So I decided to investigate the material and the material itself is called privacy control. So that's the way I kind of derive my titles. The titles aren't that interesting. They're just the titles of the material I'm using sometimes. Um, so the, the, there's scaffolding and there are these these materials and the material itself, this privacy control is activated through light. So if the light shines on it, it creates a mirror and the light shines from behind it, it creates this ability for you to see what's behind it. So these are the last chapters of the Quran and they are um, memorized by millions of people. And so I decided to do a feminist translation of the English uh, translation because English is inherently a colonial language. So I wanted to decolonize and 
feminize the translation in my own words and hide it behind and obfuscate it behind this two-way material. And this is an example of another installation. There's four of those prayers that one memorizes for protection. And I climbed it again, another climbing process. And I would reveal the words with my, with my light, with my headlight as I climbed it. Okay, so uh, archival collages is a little bit like we've already kind of touched base with the beginning of the of the talk. I was talking about making cards and like looking at these like kind of trails of clues to kind of understand where I'm from and who I am. Um, and so I just started to take all of that information and put them into frames and collage and do the collage work, cutting away, laying on top of, Xerox copying, um, you know, photographing, paint. Not, I don't, I'm not painting, but what I am doing is I'm using uh, different colors of acrylic plexi to create pigmentation. And I like to have a kind of a cutout, a portal in, in these collages because I'm interested in portals and transitional spaces. Ephemera, personal ephemera. I was also doing that. I, I have like different titles for different sets of collages. So um, when I was in Italy doing the Braid Rage performance, I all was lucky enough to be able to go around and look at uh, architecture. And I started to think about the Corinthian column as this real like position of power. It was like a symbol that you see in municipalities, you know, churches, um, banks. So I decided to make my own columns, my own kind of artifacts. Earlier that year, I was asked to do a postcard project in Harlem for the Studio Museum. And one of my privileges is I know how to pray and I can go into a mosque and know what to do and pray. So I went to the Malcolm Shabazz Mosque and noticed that they wrapped the columns with the same rugs that are on the ground. And this is like a classic auntie, classic uncle thing to do that someone thought it was a great idea to kind of hide the fact that those columns need to be there structurally to hold up the ceiling. They were like, why don't we just like obfuscate and deny that these things exist by wrapping the carpet around it? I think that's hilarious. So I went with that and decided to do that same kind of move with the Corinthian column and um, started to kind of develop my ideas. I made some rugs, uh, personalized some rugs and then adored them on the outside of the, of the column. Here you go, you can see it here. And so um, some other things about the column is instead of making it out of cement, I wanted to um, make it in a material that was really light that I could hold. Um, so this is actually Pink Panther material. It's, a, it's an architectural foam. And I, and I love the idea that the materials say Pink Panther. The middle section of the column is empty and so uh, with these resin plaques. And so you can really see the color shine through with these works. Um, and you can see this in this image, you can see that the light's passing through. Um, this is currently at the Wexner Center. So this work is up in Columbus, Ohio currently. And then I also was able to make collages from the kind of research material that I was thinking through and the snakeskin collages are identified by the strip of, of carpet that's around, th that's used for the spacers of the installation of the um, collage. Um, one of the things to note about this work is if you cut plexi a certain way, 
it actually acts like a light bulb, which I'm pretty fascinated by. And um, the other thing is there's these little scratch outs that I am using in a humorous way to kind of suggest that I'm redacting information. And so anytime I saw a system of power in these uh, documents, I would kind of scratch it out. And then I took that scratch out and I put it in an illustrator, made a vector and cut it out with Plexi. You can see examples of that here. So it's layering, it's like collage, photo collage, layering, cutouts of Plexi, layering. Um, and then I have this technique um, and I hold all of my artifacts in my hand and I, I body scan, I do scans. Um, and you can tell that if you look at this in person, you can see the that my skin is pushed up against a substrate. It's pushed between two different things. So it creates an effect that is very performative and very um, indicative to one's situation when they're looking for their position of power within an imperial patriarchal society. This is a humorous work in a way. It's the Northeastern view of the sky. And I'm kind of just like, assuming that there's satellites there that are surveilling us. So I humorously just scratched out wherever I thought maybe the satellites would be existing. But then it actually turned into something else where it's almost like I was graffitiing the sky. So it might end up being a series. It's kind of cool to me. So this is new work. Um, I created a, a body scan uh, situation where I was able to use some cameras to scan my entire body while I was holding objects, because obviously using the kind of computer tabletop scanners weren't big enough for that. So I ended up making these collages recently, some of which are showing at Wexner, some of which are going to be showing at the Booker Museum. And you know, this is actually a professional photograph of the work. And one of the things I like about showing these bad images is that you can really see all the different things that are happening in the space at the same time. For example, there's a person standing in front of it. And I like the idea of you viewing the work and always seeing your projection and what's behind you and what's in front of you and what's through the material all at the same time, similar to privacy control. By Faith is a uh, ongoing project based on sleep patterns and living through COVID and having the opportunity actually to make a TV show. So these are backdrops for the TV show. They're now sculptures. Um, those of you who may be able to be in New York, which probably none of you will be able to, there's actually an opening of this new work at Miles McHenry on May 13th. So there's a lot I can say about a lot of this work, um, but you know, maybe we can double back if you have particular questions. But you, know, you can see that these were backdrops made to create the environments that now live as soft sculptures. And they're held up by selfie lights and microphone stands. So this is an ongoing work. I think the pilot could be done maybe at the end of 2022 or 23. If you're interested in the interworkings of this project, you can go to kitchen, the Kitchen NYC and look my name up and, and actually view clips from the project. So this is uh, the end of my slideshow and I wanted to end by sharing a few details of what I'm thinking to do for the Brooklyn Museum show. So this is a new sculpture that I'm thinking to do based off of some of their antiquities. This particular um, artifact lives at the Met, but they have similar objects at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, I'm being asked to show in the three rooms that adorn, that uh, hug the dinner party, the Judy Chicago dinner party. And again, the show opens October 1st.
Okay, I'm done. Thank you. That was amazing. I, I hope so. I know I can be really overwhelming. Um, no, it was fantastic. I, I didn't find it overwhelming at all. I was really excited by it. Um, I'm going to start with a question that came to me. Um, it's actually someone else's question. Okay. Uh, in Paul, Ram Paul Ramirez Jonas um, has this list of 100 questions. Um, and one of the questions in them in, in these hundred questions is, if the state speaks through, through bronze and stone, what is our material? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really struck by, you know, Mac in his opening comments talked about your, your use of materiality and, and the way that you're spanning these things. I guess I would say, posing that question to you, like what is our material troubling that? And even thinking of who you are thinking of in that we, of who is the our in our material, and just to, to talk about your use of material and, and what you're using it for and, and, and why, and you know, that span of textile to these molds and rock climb, it's just such a, it's such a span, it's such an impressive span. And so with that, with your material, I'm also thinking about if you were to think about permanence and permanent materials, and if you, your work did become sketches for these things that are to mark landscapes for a hundred years, like what would you, what would be your approach? I'm just really curious about it. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Well, it is my opinion, if I were to be asked to make a monument, if I were to be asked to make a public permanent installation, uh, it would be to the scale of feeling uh, a phenomenological experience as many monuments do, it'd be large. Um, I think that I personally wouldn't feel comfortable having uh, a work that was just there and it was plastic and static, that it was just a representation of something like a beautiful utopian idea. I would want it to facilitate some kind of refuge. So I've actually been thinking about a public monument sculpture that hopefully one day I can make based off of color and color therapy and how um, if you were to actually layer them kind of similarly to what I'm doing with the collages, you can make multiple different colors that would reflect and create other colors throughout the course of the day when the sun hits the sculptures. So you would have these kinds of like moments of refuge where you can go into different panels of the sculpture and then be able to really just like work on your heart chakra, work on your this, work on your brain, work on your money bag, work on, you know, wherever. And you would be, um, there'd be like a plaque or a chart that would enable you to know where you wanted to spend most of your time in that sculpture. So like, all that to say is that's my idea. That's like a way that I feel like these public spaces should be. They should be um, more than a symbol because we need more than symbolic help. We need systemic change. Thanks. Hmm. I really, I really appreciate that response in so many ways. Um, the idea that we need more than symbols, uh, I think really rings so true now more than ever, but for decades probably, right? Like um, the, the process of summarizing the issues is uh, a little bit beyond where we are. Uh, we need to start crafting um, some, some support, if not uh, beyond support, even like solutions through, I think the creative energies that so many people in our field have. Um, you know, this is why I think people like Sharita should be running for public office maybe at some point. Um, <laughs> but, and I, and, I, and I think with that too, I was like, 
I was really starting to make these connections in the talk today too, to like some of what, like what Vijay Prashad talks about in his book, wow. uh, the darker, the darker nations. Totally read um, that book upside and down, you know, where, yeah. You know, where, where he's really like, you know, like, I mean, really riffing off Franz Fenton in so many ways where he's talking about the, the, the Middle East being not really a place, but a project um, and the ways in which um, like, like the ideas of like solidarity between different nations. And I mean, in, in some ways, I mean, like what Vijay's in this piece by uh, Nahima Hayam, you know, two meetings in a funeral um, that really gets into the non-aligned movement um, uh, in that history. And I feel like there's so much wrapped up in what you're working on that is like uh, these tendrils out into some of these notions. I mean, I, I saw you, Franz Fenton was in your, uh, in the reading group. I remember that book actually from, um, from the Participant Inc. show. Mm -hmm. And then there was something that, that I like, kind of realized that like there's something about the climbing and this act of climbing that is starting to be repeated through some of your practice um, that is about this sort of like getting up and off of the floor and up and out of the space um, and this kind of utilization of the artworks. Um, and I'm just curious, I'm just curious to hear you like think, like think about that, like that process of climbing um, and, and maybe even like with this idea that like the material that you chose in this question um, that Sharita just posed was basically color uh, is the material, like colored light. And there's, there's something so lovely about that um, and that kind of like immersion out. Mm -hmm. You know, um... I feel like you said things that were efficient and I don't know how to augment what you're saying, but what I can add is um, during the preparation for braid rage in 2017, there were other people doing other climbing projects that were actual activists that were actually starting to dismantle symbols of distress in our society right? These monuments. So I actually learned about this person, this particular activist much later. Uh, her name is Patricia Akumo. So I learned that during around the time when I was doing braid rage, she was actually out in the public space climbing the Statue of Liberty. And she refused to come down until children were uncaged, people were clothed, you know, she had her terms. So I was trying to get a hold of her during the Albany performance because that had been, you know, 2017, 18. I think I was still in, trying to develop certain ideas about the project. And then by 2019, I was like, can we do a public program with this person? I want to sit down with this person. It didn't happen. But then in 2020, during the pandemic, Noma wanted to work with me. And so we made the film, we screened the film and they were able to approach Patricia Akuma when we sat down and did an interview. So it was so interesting to sit down with an activist and someone who was kind of doing similar work that I'm doing, but we're both working in different niches. Like for, for Patricia, she's kind of out there doing this public service. And, and all that she was really doing was displaying rage. For me, I was inside these erratic spaces that I chose to be in. And I just want to unpack what that is because I have to make art. Art is the origin of thought, but I don't have to engage with the manic acceleration of capitalism that happens within these spaces. So, Climbing inside museum spaces, gallery spaces, institutional spaces is the only way Braid Rage works for me. So we kind of came together to have this conversation about what is art and what is activism and what is the you know inverse of that. I don't know if that helps augment what you said. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, yeah, just thinking about that climbing practice. 
and then I, I, I do think like kind of past that there is something, um, I don't know, around these processes of, of understanding these histories. And maybe this is maybe back to the kind of Vijay Prashad um, text uh, and like the way, like the ways in which, especially I, I, I mean, actually with both of the exhibitions I saw, um, there is this sharing that's you're you're like bringing I think to the audience of of these kinds of um, complicated and unknown histories. I mean, in some ways, with snakeskins, with that the German magazine that you were using the collage out of, um, and then this way of positioning them that takes them out of the realm, takes their power away. Um, and provide something for us to kind of dig into. And I, then I feel like there's something like that with the history that VJ is presenting in that text mm -hmm. that allows us to, to really understand um, the ways in which the leaders uh, in the Middle East and in the quote unquote th third world were thinking about themselves uh, in the international stage um, and how that is now being you know, kind of replaced. Um, mm. Well, I guess um, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And one way that, or one one thing you can add to the reading list is there was a book that Edward Said wrote. It's a collection of essays. And it was about media in America. So what he bothered to do was collect every media article uh, from like the late eighties into nineties based on the Gulf war, based on the, the resource war, <laughs> based on the acquiescing of minerals, oil, you know, whatever, and occupation of land. So all of these articles, whether they were in the Atlantic, whether they were in the New York times, whether they were in any very prestigious lefty, you know, cool kid, progressive place platform, there was an intentional slandering of Islam. And so what he started to do was unpack all of that. Um, and, and I highly recommend that book to anyone who is thinking about journalistic progress or any kind of progress for that matter, because as you know, we can't even turn the news on to understand what's happening in our local environments because it's all an augmentation of truth. There's some corporation giving money to that news media that they have to curtail the truth to. So actually reading that book has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with sharpening your critical thinking skills because that's our only way out. Like if we don't know how to actually critically understand what's happening in our surroundings, we won't move forward. That is why there are buzz terms right now, gaslighting, right? Microaggressions. These are all invisible things that are happening to us that we have to actually really hone in on and read. Their skills. So they're like, it's almost like invisible hieroglyphics. Um, so I think that that's really what I can say to all that is that um, we have to do a lot of work on our own now. Um, whereas before we actually had people, players, representatives that were kind of like trying in our local environments to do that work. You, you mentioned in the, the slides of the, your current work, the most recent work um, about the, with the backdrops and things, there was, a, there was a part where you were like, oh, I can explain more about this if there's time or someone's curious. And I am curious, I'm, I'm, I'm curious like what's being staged there and, and why just a little bit more that would be really cool to hear about. So 
as you as you all noticed, I could have probably picked one group of work and created an hour around just that one work. Probably I, I could do it because I've done it before. So um, rushing through the slideshow, my apologies, but um, by faith is inscribed at the top of the door of my apartment in Crown Heights that I've lived in for 10, 10 plus years. And it, this, 10, this decade is, has been very transitional for me as a human being. And then I'm kind of also documenting the stuff that's around me. I'm becoming smarter as a person. I'm like starting to understand when someone's uh, telling you what you want to hear, <laughs> basically. And so I, as everyone was quarantining, and I was given an opportunity well in advance to do this project at the kitchen that was a six week residency. And knowing that it was like a very large, handsome space, um, I, I started to dream and envision that there was a TV show dedicated to the strange space that I occupy as a human being. Um, you know, I'm somebody who's an avid TV watcher, I watch. I'm currently trying to finish Moesha for the fifth time, you know, like I watch, you know, living single, I watched um, girlfriends, I've watched, um, you know, the nanny, I watched the golden girls, I watch, you know, these are the things that um, are important to me as a maker, because I don't actually think that TV shows are trash. I think that they are the undergirding of society and what people are pushing up against at times or people trying to cover up because there's like a lot of cotton candy out there too. And I like those shows too. I love Sex and the City, <laughs> you know, like whatever, whatever. I mean, but um, I basically forced myself to sit in bed when I had COVID and write scripts for a TV show. And I knew that I had a very small budget. So I made these backdrops based off of the corners of my apartment. So I photographed the sectors of my apartment. So there are six sectors in my apartment and those are based off of feng shui reading. So there's a love sector, a, a, a celebration sector. Uh, uh, and then, so like the titles of all these sculptures are actually um, in reference to those sectors. And then each TV show will be in reference to those sectors. So I always had the intention of utilizing those backdrops and creating these biomorphic forms for future for a future project because I like to recycle my materials. Um, and so whenever I was done with uh, shooting some of the work for by faith, I went ahead and created those soft sculptures. And that's what you were seeing. They were um, held up with microphone stands and all of the materials that you see on a set of a television show or any kind of film show. Um, the show is about me having a fever and assuming that COVID didn't happen and my friends are hanging out with me. So there's these dream sequences where I'm on the bed, but then I'm at the dinner table and I'm hanging out with my friends and having a great time. But all the while, there's all this chaos around us. And we're talking about how um, painting and colonialism would like ba basically galleries and the, the art world wouldn't exist without colonialism. Um, we we're talking about Dutch paintings and, you know, trades and things like that um, in the show. Um, and I think, you know, there are lots of people that have tried to make TV shows about the art world. But I think the problem is that there's no one ever that's been natively in the art world that has bothered to make a TV show. So like even Spike Lee, we know that Spike Lee's a great artist. He tried to make a terrible TV show about a painter. Like that, that show brought me joy, but it was also terrible and it was not true. Like that is not a painter's life. Um, it's called, she's got to have it. Um, so I just kind of was like, you know what? I can do this. Like, I know these painters, I know these artists, I know the world. 
I, I facilitate so many roles in the art world and I'm clever and I, I'm good at writing and I'm, I'm, I'm charming. I can get people to like enact themselves. And so that's what by, by faith is. And that's what by faith hopes to be. Awesome. Um, we got an, a question that is slightly related to your answer here and, and this work. What are some of the sources of your sense of humor? Your work is unusually serious while also having what feels like deadpan mysterious humor. That's what the person wrote. Ooh, that's really, it's a really good question. Can you give me an example in my, um, in my presentation? Mm. I hope that uh, that person types uh, some of the examples here um, and then, and we can, I'll chime in when they do. But yeah, I, know. I grew up listening. I, I, I grew up uh, watching Pee Wee's Playhouse. I, um, again, like most of the shows that I watch on television are very text heavy and very humorous because they all happen in like Golden Girls happened to run a dinner table. Like there was no there there. It was just like a bunch of girls in Miami wilding out, you know, and like they're humorous. Um, my dad was a very humorous person. Andy Kaufman, love. Um, I could have answered this if I had a glass of wine. Um, I think that there's so much pain and across the board, psychically, we have so much therapy to do to move forward that the only way I can move forward is laughing. And you know, it's funny that most comedians are some of the depressed people in the world because, you know, life is dark and twisted. And my apologies for the work being so serious. It's just that, you know, there are these little containers where you're like, you have an hour and you can talk about your work. But then for me, I'm not talking about my work. I'm talking about my positionality. I'm talking about my life. And there's essays within essays for each move I make. So I have to choose how to flatten into some condensed version about my work. And I also think that I'm never gonna be able to talk about my work again. So I feel like I'm running with a knife chasing me or something, if that makes any sense. Maybe that's a good place to end it. I mean, we're at eight o'clock, so we've been at this for okay. a while. And <laughs> I, I love that image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like with me running down the street with someone chasing after me with a knife. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe after the Brooklyn Museum show, I won't feel so like weird about never having a show again, but you never know. Yeah. Well, this was so rad. Well, I to watch the recording again and just really soak in because you, you really packed in so much and, and really just there were world within worlds there. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And um, especially the opening poem, I can't wait to really sit with how much is in there. There's just, like you said, yeah. an hour, hours within each example. So thank you so much for, for your time this evening. Thank you all too. This is like, was awesome. And thanks for like not, you know, kicking the can down the line because I really wanted to do this. So thank you. Thanks, Mac. Yeah, I'm super excited we could make it happen. Yeah, and I and I hope to uh, lure you out here to Portland at some point too. So there will be better days. Yes, definitely there will be. There will be. Stay in touch. See you. Yes. See you soon. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Sharita. Right.